please welcome our dear friend, Reverend John Revelle. Peter, I'd really like to thank you for that introduction. I'd like to, but I can't really find it in my heart to. So. I've spent a lot of time in the Deep South, and uh, there's a phrase that is popular down there, and it can be used in a, different, a number of different settings. One setting is if you're struggling and you are having a difficult time, uh, they'll say, bless your heart. Or if you've done something that's really nice, they'll say, bless, bless your heart. But sometimes it's used of individuals who are slightly off, mentally. They're not quite all there. They're struggling, and they may do something that's silly or uh, inexplicable, and the people will say, oh, bless your heart. So, Peter, bless your heart. <laughs> I'll second that. <laughs> and you take your pick, okay, of, of which of those, or all of the above. It's great to be here this morning. Let me ask, how many of you, when you were kids, uh, when you were a young boy, thought of, when I'm grown up, I want to be a cop or a firefighter. Let me see your hands. Yeah, a lot of us. Uh, when I was a kid, my earliest memories of my dad, he was a pastor, but before that, he was a police officer, and uh, police, he was a cop in Central Florida. And my earliest memories are of him coming home in his uniform, in his, do we have to have that up there? This, this, uh, no, we don't want that yet. So, hold on. No, it's, it's What are some specific... All right. Well, let's push the button when I told you to. I'm sorry. <laughs> Chaplains are not technologically savvy, okay? All right. All right. Just deal with it. Deal with it. Uh, as I was growing up, though, and, and at first I thought, you know, it'd be great to be a, a cop when I grew up. Uh, but it never really took, and I admired my, cop, uh, my father for being a cop, but it never really took on as far as a, uh, an ambition. And so you know, I'm a pastor. As part of what Peter said is true, I've been in pastoral ministry, church ministry for uh, over 30 years. That's, that part was true. Uh, <laughs> suck it up, ministries? Peter, really? Weenie and otherwise? But I never really thought of being involved with the police department or fire department. Uh, and so how does a pastor from Nashville, Tennessee, end up as chaplain for the police department of the third largest city in the state of Connecticut? Many of you may not know that now Stanford is, uh, it surpassed Hartford as the, high, the third highest population. So, uh, okay. Uh, but the, the, um, the police department there is recognized as one of the finest in the state. Stanford has the lowest crime rate, uh, violent crime rate in New England. So how on earth did that happen? And I'll tell you, I never really aspired to be a chaplain. One day I went into the office. We were showing the movie Courageous. Anybody seen the movie Courageous uh, about the, the cops down in Georgia? We were showing it, and I thought it would be nice to invite our police department. So. I called the chief, asked him uh, if I could meet him, and he said, sure, come on up. And we were talking, and uh, his, uh, Bob Nivikoff is his name. He is as salty as they come. I mean, every other word is an expletive, and he doesn't care if I'm a pastor from Nashville or anywhere else. I mean, it's just blankety-blank, blankety-blank. And uh, so he said, well, what's your interest in cops? And I said, well, I, I'm just interested in inviting the cops. My dad was a Marine in the South Pacific in World War II, and then he was a cop before he became a pastor. And a couple of other comments went by, and then he said, well, let me ask you something. Would you be willing to be our chaplain? And I said, okay, that sounds good to me. Uh, why not? And I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Because just a few weeks later, early one Thursday morning, I get a call, and they, they call me Rev because Reverend Ravel is, is a lot of, it's a mouthful, row, 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 row. So they just started calling me Rev, and it was Bob uh, Nibs on the other line, and he said, Rev, we've got a bad situation. Uh, one of my officers uh, fell over an embankment off of I-95 
and he's at Norwalk Hospital, and I don't think he's going to make it. And he's got a, a wife and three young children. Uh, would you be willing to go down there? And I, I went down there, and uh, he was pursuing a suspect, uh, got off exit 16, uh, chased him off, he got out of the car, and he went off the side of the ramp into the bushes, and Troy didn't realize what was on the other side of the bushes, and he chased him and went headlong and fell off the top of the exit ramp down 25 feet onto, he landed on the guardrail on I-95. And it ripped his nose off his face, it totally destroyed his arm, and what they didn't know at that point is it separated his uh, small intestines from his stomach. And he, he almost died. In fact, he knows that the only reason he didn't die is because God saved him, and, and he, has, he said that. But I went down to the hospital and I, I met with his wife uh, and then started uh, follow-up. The Lord did save him, and he started recovery. And so Debbie and I would go over um, a couple of times a month, take her world-famous uh, chocolate chip uh, brownie cookie concoction that the cops now love. And that started a, a serious relationship. And it, what it did is it broke down some of the barriers with the other cops. They were really suspicious. One of the things that you need to know is cops are suspicious. Am I right? Greg? They're, with good reason. I mean, they're, they see themselves in more and more as targets of, well, all kinds of, uh, it, it was just uh, accusations and, and suspicions, and now it's their literal targets. But uh, the cops were suspicious at first, but after I started showing up and we were showing real care for the family, they started to warm up. And then after that, Sandy Hook happened. And um, I ended up doing uh, the chief asked me to be the, uh, the special pastor for the honor guard, and he said, Rev, the honor guard is primarily a bunch of pirates and, and barbarians, and they need all the help they can get. And as I got mixed up with them, I realized he was right, a bunch of pirates and barbarians. But I told him, I, I told Niv, I said, you know, my family background is a bunch of pirates and barbarians, seriously. And I said, I can relate to those guys. And so, uh, we ended up doing several of the funerals. The one uh, just up on the coast was for one of the teachers, and uh, the honor guard asked me to stand in formation with them, and so uh, we were formation outside the funeral home. And as I'm there, this was on uh, Monday night, um, no, I'm sorry, Tuesday night, one of the first responders, and I'll, I'll not give any identity, identity. He came up to me and he saw my, my badge uh, and saw that I was a chaplain and he had that glazed look in his eyes. And if you have ever been around somebody who's been in a trauma, there's that, that dazed look. And he just started talking. He, was, he had to help process the scene and he had to work around those babies who were slaughtered that day and he just started talking and uh, I, I let him talk and I said listen what's your faith background and he says well I'm Jewish and I said well obviously I'm not but would it be okay if I prayed with you and he said please please and I prayed with him and I could see the Lord minister into his life a level of peace the next day, uh, the funeral was for this teacher. It was an amazing uh, funeral. And uh, so we had to get from Stratford all the way up to Newtown for the next funeral. And so after the, the graveside, one of the motorcycle cops, and I'll not say his name, he came up to me and said, okay, Rave, you're going with us, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, okay, you've got to keep up with us. We're going with our lights and sirens and crap, uh, and you've got to keep up with us. And I said, no problem. He said, put your flashers on. We're going to have uh, five motorcycles. We're going to be going around, so you have to keep up with us. And I said, great, fine, no problem. And so we took off, and we're going through Stratford and Bridgeport at like 50, 60 miles per hour downtown. I've never done that before. <laughs> and I felt guilty thinking, this is cool. Because I, we're right in the middle of all of this horror, 
And here is this Mazda 6 with five motorcycles circling around it going through, and people are standing on the sidewalk looking. Who's that dignitary that's being escorted through town? And we got all the way up to Newtown in 23 minutes from Stratford. And, yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying as we're going. And so get out of the car, and this cop comes up and says, Rev, you did that just right. That was awesome. It's like you've done this all along. You did everything just right. You know, and after a while, you get in the, the, the cycle. The, the one goes around, and they're cycling. And so uh, I got into it, and he said, you can ride with me anytime. And I said, anytime you want me to, you let me know, and I'll ride with you. And he said, I bet that was your first Code 3. And I said, yeah. I didn't know what a Code 3 was, but I said, yeah. I, f I found out that Code 3 is lights and sirens and crap. Except he didn't say crap. Uh, and so after that, he started calling me Code 3 Rev. And the other cops, the other motorcycles, uh, and there were five of us, and then it went to four. And so they started calling themselves the Core 4 and Code 3 Rev. And that kind of formed a bond. But the next day, we had a uh, full slate of funerals, and so we met at the Newtown Diner, and I had those cops before we went out to the first one. I had them gather around, and we had special prayer, and they'd never had anything like that before. And so we went to the next two funerals, and at the end of the day, as we get to the cemetery, and that was the last one for me of that day, uh, <clears throat> uh, this lead guy in the motorcycle cops He's off of his motorcycle, and he and one of the other guys are talking. So I decided it's time for me to go home. So I pulled up, and I waved at him. And he snapped to attention, serious as can be. And he saluted me like that. And I saluted back. And I broke into a mess of sobs. And the other cops affirmed he was serious. Well... The next day, I couldn't make it, and one of the cops, I'm going to call him his name, Jimmy. I'm not going to give his real name, but he told me last Thursday, he said, you need to tell our story. Whenever you talk to people, tell our story because of what's happened. He was in Newtown, um, uh, one of the funerals, and he was preparing to block off the next street, and, and that's how the, the motorcycle cops do it. They rotate to block off the street for traffic. And a person off the side of the road uh, had grown impatient, and so she pulled out, not looking, and pulled right in front of him, and he T-boned her with his motorcycle. And it destroyed his wrist and his knee, and he went to the hospital. And one of the cops said, uh, Rev, your prayers aren't good unless uh, it's line of sight. I mean, uh, praying from a distance doesn't work because he got hurt. And so I challenged him about being an authority on prayer, and he, uh, he backed off. But I went to the hospital, uh, the next day, and Jimmy had never had anybody pray with him before. Jimmy was, is, as hardcore a heathen as you can ever imagine. Big, burly, strong, foul mouth. They told me his next, uh, his nickname is Effer, uh, but uh, Effer is the the polite term. He had never had a cop uh, had a. Uh, a, a chaplain come and pray with him. So I prayed with him over the uh, the um, bedside, and then a few days later, right after Christmas, he had surgery, and we started following up. And I started going to his house uh, up state Connecticut a couple of times a month and praying with him and encouraging him. And in the course of time, he said, "Rev, I'm close," because we talked about the Lord. We talked about real issues. He said, don't give up on me. Keep praying for me. I'm close. Not long after that, I got a, a horrible call that his son, who was serving in Afghanistan, uh, was on patrol in a perimeter of an Air Force base, and he saw uh, the formation of uh, an ambush, and he was on lead, and he pushed deliberately placed himself between the attackers and his team and pushed them out of the way and he died in the course of it and Jimmy was devastated as you can imagine so I was with him that, that whole week and uh, did the funeral uh, a thousand people or so were there and 
over the course of time, he has come back off of, he's, he was down in the pits, and he started to come back. And that basically cemented my heart for these guys. Because I started to see the kinds of things that they go through on a daily basis. Things that we don't know. Greg was talking about how you don't talk about it and how the veterans don't talk about it. The cops don't talk about it. They go through garbage. 9-11 brings all of our first responders to mind and we think of them on a day like today. But the reality is these guys are facing horrific kinds of scenes every day. It's not just the cataclysmic events of 9-11. There are daily cataclysmic events. It's not all just Sandy Hook. Daily, they're seeing garbage. I'll get to that in a second. And so in the course of all of this, it has reminded me of three lessons. And I say remind me, they're not brand new, but they're, they're things that I've been reminded of. Let me read this, this verse, if you don't mind. I hope it's okay to read the Bible here. Is that all right? Um, this is 1 Peter chapter 2, and it says in verse 13, Submit to every human institution because of the Lord, whether to the emperor is the supreme authority, or to governors, those sent out by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For it is God's will that you, by doing good, silence the ignorance of foolish people. Now, let's put it in the context of honoring, submitting to the governing authorities and the agents of those authorities who keep the peace. And by doing that, it says you silence the ignorance of foolish people. As God's slaves live as free people, but don't use your freedom as a way to conceal evil. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. That honoring the emperor means honoring all of his agents. Now, obviously, we don't have a king. We have a government. But the, the underlying point there is honoring and submitting to the authority that is in place. And we've lost our connection with honoring law enforcement. Cops now have targets on their back. And a lot of it is because of the prevailing, uh, pervasive mindset that cops are the bad guy. Now, this doesn't have to happen just in, and I'm not going to blame gangs. I've heard it amongst the brothers, not you guys specifically, but the brethren, of talking in a demeaning way about cops or law enforcement. Or can you believe that I got a ticket? I mean, that jerk. How many of you have seen the video, and it's on Facebook, but it's also YouTube, about the uh, Palm Beach County Sheriff's deputy who pulled over a speeder in the uh, a school zone. Anybody seen that? I'll give you the, the word, but I don't want to give it away. I'll give you the term to look up on YouTube. But this woman was doing 51 in a school zone, which was uh, 20 mile per hour. And his dash cam picks it up, and she wants to get just a warning, and he won't give a warning because uh, their policy is in school zones when you're going that fast because of the danger to children, there's no warning, it's an automatic ticket. The dash cam has him coming up to her car and she said, and she's obviously disgusted, she said, it's no wonder you're, you people are getting shot at. You're a bunch of blank holes. Now, this is a cop doing his job, protecting children, and the response is, it's no wonder you guys are getting shot. And if you want to Google it, it's no wonder you people are getting shot at. That is a collapse of honor. Honor towards the agents of government that keep peace. If you were to look at my Facebook, I have as my profile picture the thin blue line. And I say on there, the thin blue line, the only thing that separates society from anarchy. And yet we take cops for granted. There is little or no honor. So that was the first reminder. The second reminder is to pray. And you guys can look it up on your own. Uh, second, uh, First Timothy chapter 2 says, Pray for the kings and those in authority that there would be peace. Our law enforcement officers go through stuff that you cannot imagine. I'm just going to play this clip.
When you face crisis, first responders are there for you. But when first responders face crisis, who is there for them? This matters to me because I'm a cop, and I work with most of the people in this video. They are the ones who have to deal with this, and we ask them four questions. Their raw, candid, and unscripted answers demonstrate the critical need and the vital help that is available. First question, what are the unique challenges and pressures inherent in serving as a first responder? Every day, there's a process where I leave the house that my wife and my children have to go through. I have to go through mentally before I leave the house to know um, i got to go do my job. I'm going to lay my life on the line ultimately if I have to. Um, and I may not come home. When I was in the Marine Corps, I would deploy for a six-year, a six-month tour or a nine-month tour, and I would have uh, a, a, process, a process I would go through with my wife and, and family where they they begin to uh, almost isolate because they know that they're not going to have you around us for six to nine months, and that you ultimately may not come home. Um, this is done every day in a law enforcement house. Personally, I, I was one of the, the first few officers to arrive on the scene, and I happened to come across the woman who had been mauled by the chimpanzee, and I happened to see her face and missing body parts, hair and teeth. Uh, bitter face, the most part of her face, uh, her fingers, uh, her teeth. I happen to see a lot of that stuff uh, lying on the ground. And I was asked, because I had a patrol shotgun, to go inside the house and look for him and possibly shoot him. Knowing what I just saw outside, having to go inside, was one of the most frightening experiences ever. Now, this is just a a couple of scenarios on this video uh, I was able to put together a couple of months back. And the rest of it shows all the different things these guys go through. Uh, since I've been there, I've had one first responder tell me about his horror in one of, he was a former uh, firefighter in New York City, how one of his guys was the first to die in 9-11 when a jumper landed on him and took him out and that still haunts him. Uh, I've had guys who have to do horrific investigations. One guy who is fine with me, in fact, he's told the story in public, told how he was working in computer forensics and internet crimes against children, which is child porn, and they were doing a, a case in Stanford, and as part of the investigation, he had to look at the stuff that was on this suspect's hard drive. And he's looking at photos and images of grown men raping three and four month old baby girls. And they're expected to do that as part of the job. A normal mind cannot see that and process it, but he's a cop and he's got to do it. Just this, this I, I could fill up an hour with stories, but just a, a few weeks ago we got, uh, I got a call and said, Rev, there was a tragic accident. Uh, a mom's car backed over her three-year-old uh, daughter and it backed over her head and uh, she's at the hospital. And so I ran down there and uh, I got to connect with the first responders. Now the good news is they thought that she was dead or that if she lived, she would have permanent brain damage. And as it turns out, the wheel went over her neck and she's recovered miraculously. But they didn't know that at the time. So they get there and they see this mess on the driveway. And after we're, we take, uh, or they take her to uh, the stadium, the field where the air, the rescue helicopter came, uh, medevac, and airlifted her to Yale, uh, New Haven. Uh, one of the cops that I knew, I know well, he was the first on the scene. And I saw that look in his eyes. And I said, hey, let's go get something to eat. And he just talked. 
This is the kind of stuff that haunts first responders, and you don't hear about it. They're not comfortable talking to, uh, to shrinks about it because there's a stigma and they're afraid of the Freedom of Information Act that it could be uncovered, but they're comfortable talking to a chaplain. And so that's a lot of what I do is just listen so they can get this stuff off their, their minds and their hearts. We have a responsibility to pray according to Scripture, to pray for our government leaders, but the agents of our government. And that includes firefighters, EMTs, and cops. I can tell you they need your prayer support. And then the third is compassion. I'm going to show you another clip and explain why. Uh, this clip is by, uh, all of this is Stanford Cops, and they're talking about what the Rev has done, and I w almost didn't put this in the video, the original video, because I, I thought it was like building me up, but my wife Debbie said, no, what they're, they're not talking about you, they're talking about the compassion of God that they see in your life, and this is what I want you guys to leave with, the essentiality of compassion, expressed compassion. Scripture says, uh, Galatians 6, 6, bear one another's burdens. We're so caught up in our own crises, we're, it's hard, and I'm, I'm so glad that, uh, that Paul put up the 60 second. It's hard for us to see past our own set of circumstances to see what others are going through. We need to be showing compassion, and what this clip shows is the impact of compassion on people's lives. What are some specific ways the chaplain has been particularly helpful? Once the chaplain came in to our job, um, it changed everything in a lot of ways towards positive communication. What, what on the other side, from a spiritual standpoint, can be done to counterbalance some of the negativity that's out there has been unbelievably uh, important for our job. We've had a horrific house fire that was here in town. Um, some of our officers had to respond there. Um, just having to be able to reach out to a chaplain to talk about it um, has made a big difference. Okay. We've had issues with uh, deaths in family uh, where um, some of our officers have lost family members. When I had um, family members in my family uh, pass away, um, I've leaned on my department chaplain. Individuals within the honor guard at times have had some pretty serious stuff going on in their life. Guys come back and tell me, man, what a great thing. I know we resisted in the beginning because the, the, the rough and tough cops generally don't want to deal with religion too much, and that's what we tend to see. And you know, we couldn't be further from that now. It's, it's uh, everybody's been blessed by it. I've seen physical changes in our guys' faces when he's on scene, which translates into comfort, uh, security, assurance has the ability to see that there's somebody that's in crisis. Taking them out of that moment of crisis and having the ability to deflate whatever the situation is. And I've seen it firsthand when he's done that with somebody. There's such profound love and pride and true care and concern emanating from him that it, it almost heals you by just being in his presence. Having a department chaplain there when you have um, officers that get hurt, you have officers that are in need when they have substance abuse or alcohol issues, and you know that he's there to be there. The Rev also, uh, during the Sandy Hook crisis, which I don't think you can put a label on what kind of human emotion is going through some, something as epic as Sandy Hook. Uh, he jumped in. It didn't matter whether it was for Stanford Police Department, other police officers, or family members, or just teachers, anybody that was involved in that mass scale tragedy was there to talk to people and you could see it and people wanna wanna they want him there to talk to them and lead them through uh, the tough things in life uh, that really test the human spirit. He's always there. There's not a time where you call him up and he's like, no, I can't make it. He always makes time. He's there. He's not there for any other reason. He's not there to jump on the bandwagon or, or because he thinks he should show up to an incident. He's there because he truly cares. And for us, that means just the world. Now, again, the point in showing that isn't to say, look at what Rev is doing. 
is to show the impact of compassion. Because all this has been has been applied compassion, being there for people in need. And what strikes me is the reason it's so unusual for them is because they're not used to seeing compassion as a way of life. But we, those who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, are called to active compassion. Uh, Colossians, for those of you who who like to look up scripture, Colossians 3, 12 said that if we're followers of Jesus Christ, we're supposed to put on a number of things, but one of those is compassion. And that's not just feeling compassion. That is taking tangible steps to demonstrate compassion. The world doesn't know the compassion of Christ because we, as his followers, have not been showing the compassion. Again, we're so inclined to focus on our pressing issues, our crisis, our struggles, our fears, our anxieties. But when we take our eyes off of us and look at what others are going through, and as true brothers bearing one another's burdens, then one of the key components of Jesus's kingdom agenda is fleshed out. So my challenge is take opportunities to show compassion, show honor to the cops, firefighters, first responders. Pray for them on a regular basis. Take steps to show compassion to them, but don't stop with them. Show compassion to each other, to your wife if you're married, to your kids if you have kids, to your coworkers. Look at what they're going through and find out what their needs are and be there for them and be there for each other. I'm going to wrap it up. I do have a couple of books. These are free. Uh, Sinful Silence. It was it's free because I've got several boxes of these left over. It was written in 2004 uh, by Ken Connor, my co-author, and I. Chuck Colson endorsed this. Jeb Bush endorsed it. It's free. They're right here. Uh, this is getting the most from God. It's just a series uh, Bible study series I did on Wednesday nights. Uh, it might surprise you. It's getting the most from God, but not how you might think. Uh, these are here. Uh, I have brochures on Lifeline Chaplaincy if you have uh, any questions. If you want a copy, a link to this video in the full, it's 11 minutes, uh, give me your email address and I'll send it to you, all right?